rule is I'm never the only person wearing a jacket. So, uh -huh. Do you mind?
and if someone has done you the disservice of taking your candy away, and you've uh, experienced any kind of withdrawal symptoms, either acute or post-acute withdrawal symptoms, you know that you're not all that pretty. You look a little like this. Now, this guy probably had clean urine for the last 40 years. And I pay attention to what I just said to you, clean urine. We still talk about clean and dirty urine. Our programming is stigmatized by old language. We talk about the war on drugs. Some things just haven't changed, OK? We don't always see it. We don't always pay attention to it or sometimes turn our back to it. It's accepted. It's normal. Someone says something like that, it goes right by it. The next time someone says you had a clean urine, did you mean negative urine? Did you mean I tested negatively? Okay. Is it possible to separate the disease from the stigma? Well, if you uh, take a look at the numbers, about 10% uh, of the population would qualify for the disease of addiction to alcohol. About that number will go up to about 14% of all drugs plus alcohol. That number goes up to about 22.5% if we add a psychiatric mood disorder or comorbidity. Okay? So, when mental illness is involved with the disease of addiction, again, we're even more stigmatized. Addiction and mental health problems are still spoken of in hushed tones. Families don't want to talk about it. I address families every week on their issues of shame. I have never met a family member that hasn't experienced some shame about having someone in their family with this diagnosis. They're not ashamed of diabetics. They're not ashamed of someone with rheumatoid arthritis. But remember, we have to own some of our behaviors. There's a history there, mainly because of the boundaries that we've crossed, because our brains have been hijacked, and we've made transgressions into the lives, privacy, and critical areas of someone else's life. We've just been too damn cool, you know what I mean? We get too cool, we get taken with ourselves, ego takes over, we get self-centered, we get prideful, Huh? And the first target of that guy's open brain, the first target of a brain disease is what? Awareness. Everybody else is aware of it, we're not. You know, one of the great functions of the brain is called proprioception. You're familiar with that term? Proprioception. See, if I close my eyes and go like this, I know intuitively, although I'm not looking at my palms facing down and now it's up, that's proprioception, where I am in space. It goes. It goes when you're an alcoholic or addict. What? I fell asleep with my arm and it's not working anymore. You know, my legs folded up under me. I'm standing on my head. They found me upside down in a garbage bin. I didn't even <laughs> you know what I'm saying. But it's also about our awareness of what we do and say. I call it turning your pocket inside out. You call it gestalt. Okay? <laughs> but turning your pocket inside out is trying to. Trying to really take someone else's mind and pull it out of their head and look at it from all sides and see where you fit in and what they think of you and wear, wear their shoes. Wear their shoes. See how we are. I mean, think about it. This disease takes a team of interventionists, takes family gathered around, children writing horrible letters, policemen coming in with court records to convince us that we have a small problem. That doesn't happen with every other disease at all. Denial, denial, denial. Okay, so that hasn't changed. People fail to seek treatment because they don't want to be labeled as an addict. They wait for the crisis to precipitate, so invariably this disease is much further advanced than most others. You know, someone has a diabetic crisis, they get treated early in their disease. Someone has, you know, a DUI or an arrest, they wait four or five or 14 years before they get treated for this disease. You know, because they're going to control it. It's not me, and I'm not like them. It's not about removing the stigma, guilt, and shame from the equation. People would find it easier to discuss openly <coughs> with a health care provider, hopefully one that knows what the hell's going on, and they go in earlier. 
I get people at the Betty Ford Center, they get people here in Pasadena Recovery Center that uh, should have been treated years ago. Years ago. You let this disease go underground and smolder on its own, shrouded by denial of the systems that keep it at bay. By the time you pop up needing help, you know, you're way down the line. Way down the line. So you ask a guy, okay, so you went into the doctor, what did he tell you? How many husbands and wives have had that conversation? Did you tell him? Tell him about your drinking. Well, how did it go in the, in the, in the doctor's office? Hmm. You know your liver enzymes are up. Do you drink? Uh-uh. No, don't have any. <laughs> Must be that damn liberatory. You should change my medication. Uh -huh. Well, if you are drinking, be careful because this is, I don't drink, doc. Three years later, he's back and his liver's about the size of a balloon. What happened? Fatty degeneration of liver. Well, what about that drinking? No, oh, no, it must be malaria. You know, that causes a big liver too. <laughs> we believe that stuff. We saw that stuff. So, you know, we're co-conspirators with the disease. We don't act as our own advocates. That is called ism. Alcoholism. And the reason it's so hard to treat is we continue to ignore the fact that alcohol and drugs target the brain and change the way our brain looks, thinks, and functions forever. And long before we had the research that absolutely proves this, by some divine miracle, someone came down to a guy and his buddies in 1939, they wrote a book about it. And the book says, it's a spiritual deal. And the book says, you better do this one day at a time. Because if you go longer than that, it's going to be like being a diabetic and going to eat a big piece of chocolate cake today because I took insulin two weeks ago last Wednesday. You know how many alcoholics and addicts tried to make it through their day because they went to a meeting last April? <coughs> it's not a one day at a time. This disease doesn't go away. <coughs> That hasn't changed. Nine out of 10 physicians in the United States miss the diagnosis of addiction in their patients, and only one out of those guys believes it's a treatable disease. Well, doctors have egos. Did you know that? Really? Pardon me. <coughs> Your doctors have the egos. You know, I went to medical school. Uh, you're supposed to come to me. I'm supposed to be big shot. I'm going to charge you and make a diagnosis, and you'll take it to the drugstore. Don't give me a diagnosis or symptoms of something that I cannot treat. If I don't think it's treatable, why would I diagnose that damn thing that I'm not even sure is a disease anyway? So I'm happy saying it's liberatory that's making your liver functions going on. I'm happy telling you that your problem might be depression because I can write a script for Prozac or Lexapro. I'm, I'm really excited that you tell me that, you know, you can't sleep at night. You must have an anxiety disorder. You know, maybe it's okay that you take a little Chardonnay, just a God spare us the Chardonnay drinkers. Oh, my God. <laughs> I'd rather go with a guy with a quarter tequila a day than a girl with a half a bottle of Chardonnay. Just like that. Just like that. Oh, my God. It's 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 you know what I'm talking about. Okay. I mean, we're also French. Aren't we? When you deal, you know, that's part of the problem. You know, we have to pardon my French and these alcohols, but we are all hopelessly addicted to our own bullshit. <laughs> primary number one. Someone gave me a little black book the other day. It was a primer on bullshit. You better see it. It's a dissertation by some English guy who talks about the nature of bullshit, the history of bullshit, why bullshit is effective, and the whole bullshit applies. <laughs> just goes on and on. You gotta read it. I left it in my bathroom. I'm probably in there. Okay. Uh, so we know doctors are slow to recognize this is a treatable disease. The patients are encouraged to find help outside the medical community. You know, maybe no milk thistle instead of the liver transplant. This is gonna work. Who likes the milk thistle? Okay? The medical community should recognize and I'm not knocking alternative beings. I mean I ran a holistic practice for 40 years. I get that. This is how it goes in the doctor's office. And this hasn't changed. 
You know, we can't be absolutely certain until we run some tests, but your initial blood work indicates that you may have a large spear through your right shoulder. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's it. This slide is very old. I haven't, been, I haven't had to change this out. Now, how many of you have been that patient? How many of you have gotten to that point where you could have told the truth that this guy's going to make it that all conspiracies with the disease? My wife invented a word as they were trying to tell me the white light of her parents. She said, you're a lousy co-conspirator. You don't know how to co-conspirit at all. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I can't co-conspirit with the dead. OK. Uh, it's not uncommon for mental health practitioners to kick somebody out of treatment if they relapse. Shame. Um, this disease has its number one symptom called relapse. If you can't deal with it, you should be treating this population. Okay? Hello. That's what, we, that's what we're all about. That's my sickness. Okay? Uh, you must get clean to do psychotherapy. Really? I'm going to tell that to all the counselors here. You, you have to be clean. You're saying, it helps. It's not necessary. If that was necessary, I'd be speaking to an empty room. <laughs> so we ostracize people. That hasn't changed. Okay, funding for addiction treatment is discriminatory. You know that. Most of the money that government spends in dry control is spent in criminal justice, not research and treatment. And the system with, uh, with stigmatization, blaming, punishing, moral judgments. I mean, come on. And now they're telling us the Affordable Health Care Act is telling us that this is all going to be nice. I don't know who does your utilization review here, but I haven't seen it work so well yet. I haven't seen it work so well yet. The only thing we've come up with is try to beef up the outpatient thing. A little, a little, a little, at least it's entry level. At least it's entry level. But with 2.4 million people being treated last year, I think that's a big tap figure, isn't it? 2.4 million being treated last year, probably 80% were treated in outpatient facilities. This is luxury. If you're in here, you're being graced by God. That's for sure. This is a big deal. Residential treatment is, is the cat's meow. I'll tell you. But that still leaves about 90% untreated of the 24 million that we, we, we haven't got to yet. However, if you take a look and read the newspapers and follow other things, there's a whole subgroup of people who are waiting to get the diagnosis. <coughs> Maybe because they're good liars and great deniers. Doesn't mean they don't have the disease. Anybody who uses drugs <coughs> or alcohol to the point where it causes them great physical potential harm or someone else would qualify the other group. Then our number goes to 90 million, one third to one quarter of the population of the US. Okay, are in danger. Do we have an epidemic? Well, what do you think? Those numbers are worse than the black. Plague. We have a plague going on. Okay. That hasn't changed. Employment, education, insurance, the ability to vote, they screw around with that if you're in recovery. They may even threaten your ability to feed your children if you have this diagnosis. You may get kicked out of an assistance program if you don't test negative. And having struggled with addiction in the past should not make life that much more difficult now. I have a chronic organic disease of the brain that relapses and remit. I choose to treat it one day at a time by the grace of God. But I have to monitor it. I don't have a meter to check my blood sugar. I don't have a cuff to check my blood pressure. Those chronic diseases have other tools. The tools of monitoring my disease is a good sponsor, a buddy in recovery, a higher power that I talk to every day. Because my name's Harry, I'm an alcoholic, in case you hadn't picked that up. <laughs> and I've been sober since I got off my knees this morning. Never more than that. The number of my coin is a personal matter between my sponsor and my higher power. It should make nobody else's business. That's just me. I only take it and get a coin so some newcomer can see that somebody can do it. And that's it. I take no pride in my own recovery. Don't take pride in yours. Only have gratitude. You can be proud of mine, and I'm certainly proud of the week that you have. That's why I get the book. Okay? That's why I get the book. But 
but I'll tell you right now, I can't take pride in my own recovery. If I take pride in my own recovery, my mind goes there, guess what? Then I'm different and I'm special, and pretty soon I figured out how I can do this and drink and use heroin like a gentleman. <laughs> <laughs> So addicted to our bullshit. <laughs> um, I think graph sucks, so I'm not going to show you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, don't you think they do? I mean, yeah. There's a couple, I'll admit, a couple of them. They, they got big lines and colors and got a lot of lines. Something that I can understand. The patient hasn't changed so much, but there is a trend, okay? There is a trend now. The patients that I see still isolate, that's for sure. Okay, most of them have their disease festering in the corner, okay, um, and um, they still have a chronic organic disease of the brain. Their life spins, that hasn't changed so much. This has changed somewhat, sadly, very sadly. We used to run the screens on these kids when they were 18, now we're running the screens for entry level at 11. Yes. And by the way, when you started and I started, what was it? Cigarette was the first thing, sip a beer the second thing, smoke a joint the next thing. Right now it's 11 years old, Oxycontin, boom. Mm. 11 years old, smoke this dope, boom. It's opiates. They get them out of the medicine cabinet, and it is an epidemic. Yes? So why do you think that is? Why? Yeah. Life sucks, then you die. <laughs> I really do. I mean, you know, people... They... So it sucks, it sucks more now for... Why, why do I think that young kids are getting access to opiates? Accessibility. It's, a, it's, it's the physician's fault. 99% of the time, they should not be put in jail and have the medical licenses removed and charged with accessory to murders. No question in my mind. They get one chance to straighten up. If they're doing it for greater money, they should be put in a slam. Okay? It's accessibility. However, drug companies are have just pumped out a new super hydro. Okay? A scammer's dream. And yet Congress didn't allow it despite Huge protest from the physician community. So who are you going to blame on that one? What's the name of that drug? Zohydro. Right. Yes, yeah, ten times more. Uh, little old ladies, um, you know, they get that hip replacement. Well, we'll talk about it. I'll show you. I'm going to explain exactly why. All right. Okay. So here's the graph. Here's the graph. It's an easy one. Shut up. Uh, so this explains something to you. you know, this is a sharp J-shaped curve. All right. But here's the critical thing I want you to see. See this old graph? This is an old graph. Here's a new graph. Look at what happened right around here. It just started like a hockey stick. You see that? Like a hockey stick. This is the percentage of teenagers and young adults using prescription uh, painkillers without prescription. This is the rise over the last 10 years. Our patients are getting older, even this old hippie. Okay, so we have programs for retirees and seniors and people with that dynamic going on. It depends what your system is. Do you have a system? Do you have a system that kept the disease at bay? Sometimes it's an educational system, sometimes it's a good job. You can see whose system is keeping them sober. Because they get home and they watch the clock and at 501 they're pouring their first 1.6 martinis. Because they have 2.4 glasses of wine with dinner, God bless you, because she can only have the other um, uh, 1.6 glasses, that would be one bottle of wine, never go over that so we can have, you know, that aperitif and then a little cognac before I go to... So, who do we see? We see people who are retiring coming into treatment. We see people who lose a spouse and become widowed or widowered in, in coming into it. Their system's breaking. We see that all the time. Um, we're seeing sicker patients. That's the changing face of addiction. Patients are much sicker than they ever have been because the drugs are much stronger than they ever have been. Anybody smoked dope in the 60s like me? Mm -hmm. Yeah, go to Denver now. Your, your head will fall off. I mean, one of the saddest things that's ever happened to me is to go back to 6th Street, Street Mall in Denver, if you know it, beautiful place, and see kids, and they, you know, they have a name for them now. They call them trust affairs. 
Trust is a 20 to 30 year old person whose trust fund hasn't kicked in yet. <laughs> who are begging and begging on the street with signs, I have a picture, signs showing a marijuana plant saying, help me support my habit. So they're begging for money to get the dope that's legal. I mean, that used to be a beautiful street, and now it's just so sad. Um, now what a, what a message are we sending to the kids? What kind of double, uh, do you get that? I, I don't, I don't. Yes, I think medical marijuana has a place, but it's available in pill form. Right. So if you got glaucoma, go for it. If it helps your irritable bowel, I love it. It probably will help pain receptors, but get it in a way that we can dose it. We know exactly how much is in the pill, not different varying strengths. And why are we calling it bongo wowie brain kill? I mean, why would we do that? <laughs> Somebody's getting very wealthy. Um, the odds of having another disease, if you have this disease, and the odds of having another addictive disease are seven times greater. Ask a room for addicts and alcoholics. How many of you just have one disease? Not a lot of hands go up, but the few that do say, okay, keep them up. Now, how many of you smoke? Okay, put your hands up. You have two diseases. You have two addictions. Okay. And how many of you have um, a little trouble with sex? Okay, put your hands down. You have two addictions. Gambling. Other process disorders, food. Okay, so we find that a lot, a lot of people have more than one addiction, which complicates the treatment. Uh, alcohol disorders with mental disorders, 37% uh, have a comorbid mental disorder. Those who are primary drug uh, disorders, 53% have another mental disorder. How much of that is drug induced? How many people have been diagnosed bipolar and uh, 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 generalized anxiety disorder and panic disorders and stuff that do go away when the substance is stopped? It's really quite impressive. Really quite impressive. If you have that disease and it has stick up, sticked around, it's sticking around after you've been treated for your primary addictive disorder, then there are appropriate psychiatric medications that can be used safely. And so the acetines are not one of them. 35% <laughs> of all hospital admissions are psychiatric admissions. 35% uh, of those have a substance use disorder along with them. 75% of trauma cases. So if you go into a major medical center where there's trauma, you have to be screened for addiction by law, by JCO mandate. Okay. Uh, I think the number of 80% of the prison population, as you can well guess, is probably small, okay? And 20% of all hospital admissions in general. So it's everywhere. New research shows that our brains are hijacked, that there's a reason for high relapse rates. It is biochemical. People with the disease of addiction have chemicals in their brain that will behave in a certain way. The number one cause of the disease of addiction is stress and the release of the corticotropin releasing factor from the brain. Now, those of you who just said, oh, thank God, I have so much stress. Let me tell you, it's not just about your mother-in-law. It's about all kinds of stress. Sometimes that's good stress. See, an alcoholic like me will drink if I'm preparing to go to my daughter's funeral. For sure, very stressful, God forbid. I'll drink if I'm preparing to go to my daughter's wedding. Very joyous. No problem. My brain can't distinguish. Same chemicals are secreted. If you haven't seen this functional MRI or PET scan that we're showing here, this is glucose metabolism in the reward center of a cocaine addict's brain. Notice that nobody's home when they show him a video of two elks making love in a meadow. <laughs> Doesn't do anything for me. But you get some clown sticking a straw up his nose, sucking up talcum powder or Aunt Jemima's pancake mix, and now, oh my God, it's all over. Where did that go? I blew it right off the thing. So, this is what happens. This is actually my own MRI. Right? <laughs> right, right, right. There's a lot of space in there. But the changes in the brain are really quite profound. And the brains of alcoholics will shrink so much, we can't tell the difference on MRIs between someone with Alzheimer's disease and someone with this disease. There's a huge amount of water around the brain. 
This is the nucleus accumbens and the amygdala activating when that. So here you have um, relapse in visual form. This is a relapse. Okay. We have any alcoholics in here? One and two? Okay. So want to see your amygdala go? Good alcoholics, right? Yes. So um, this class that I have has some weight to it right now. Oh, for those of you who may be inclined to beer, let me hear a sound for you. You hear that? Your brain just started to pay attention. Okay. Now you take that big heavy rock class and hear those ice cubes and say, I'm not going to use tongs, I'm going to grab them by my hands, of course, and I'm just going to Binding protein and delta FOS B are two of the several transfer RNA chemicals in your brain that exist in everybody with the diagnosis of alcoholism or drug addiction. These are the time bombs that will, under conditions of stress, be released by your brain to turn genes on that will direct you back to your drug of choice. Is it any wonder why we need a daily program if there's a chemical in our brain that wants me to relapse? part of the disease. Is it any wonder why my blood sugar will get elevated if I have no insulin and diabetes and I eat a piece of chocolate cake? Part of the disease. It doesn't go away. So choice is not anything that's involved here. Once a brain has been hijacked by these Chris chemicals, Chris these Chris drugs. That was my mother. I know. She's dead. So, that sounded like your mother? I thought it was my mother. Wow. What? Yeah. I thought it was my mother. My mother mm -hmm. talks to me every now and then. Did your mother oh. talk to you? No. <laughs> you should She's dead too. Call yourself, you know. She's dead too. Are you being a good husband? I have an Italian Catholic mother. She died, <laughs> died years ago. She won't leave me alone. Constantly. She was in Italy for five years. Did you ever have any Italian Catholic mothers? Yes. Yeah. You were going to eat three meatballs? Did she just have two sausages? I mean, I hear it all the time. It drives me nuts. So it sounded like the right thing. Okay. Let's talk about what has changed. The drugs have changed. When the book of Alcoholics Anonymous was written. Wow, what do we have? <laughs> Nicotine, opium, and morphine, cocaine, alcohol, rudimentary amphetamines, and marijuana. Caffeine. That's it. No one knew about Oxycontin. Oh my god. Xanax. A drug that produces the symptoms it was designed to treat. What a business model. It's better than Viagra. You've got to make a lot of money on this. You know, and it's got to escalate. You have to chase Xanax. You have to use more. Because as soon as you stop trying, the pain is worse. So it's really quite amazing. Opiates that produce their own kind of pain so people take more. Most people who are addicted to opiates because of pain reasons are amazed that the pain goes away when they stop the opiates because they produce the opiate-induced hyperalgesia, the pain of opiate use, that goes away. So they're really quite amazed. We are dealing with a crisis, that's for sure. 
I like this term farm again. Have you all are you all familiar with the term farming? Oh, yeah. Farming? No. So that P H A R M I N G. Farming. No? Who's not familiar with that term? You all know what that means. I don't know. You don't know what it means. Well, farming is when kids go home and they clean out their medicine cabinet. That's the direction. That's the admission to the party that they're going to go to. All kids have done that. There's a large bowl at the front of the party into which all the drugs that are confiscated are thrown. Unlabeled, unmarked, just as loose pills. Then they start drinking, they reach in, twirl the bowl, grab a handful, and take it home. And that's their party practice. The emergency rooms fill with these kids. Called farming. P-H-A-R-M-I-N-G. All right, since 1990, accidental drug overdose have increased fivefold. You all heard of some of the more notorious, those that get the most notoriety, Seymour Hoffman and uh, Whitney and so forth. Um, it's, this number is wrong. I've got to change the slide. This accidental drug overdose has replaced <coughs> car accident deaths now in 37 states. 37 states have reported that. Now that tells you that seat belts are great, but it tells you the drug <coughs> problem is huge. In the late 1990s, there was a huge shift in treating chronic pain. And doctors, you asked, what's the cause of this? Roughly around that time, people uh, with chronic pain started to complain that doctors were too cautious with addictive medications. And they demanded, and laws were passed, and the lawyers got a hold of it, that said that if your pain was inadequately treated, you could sue a doctor or a hospital. It was around that time that everybody started asking, what's your pain scale? One on one to 10. Take a look at the smiley faces. Are you smiley or very sad? Those kinds of things. You know what I'm talking about, right? Okay, so it became a anticipation then a medical requirement. Doctors were also required to take pain courses, okay? And in that, you started to get people getting 40 and 50 Vicodin for a root canal. The pain of a root canal goes away with the root canals now. I mean, so what do they do with these drugs? They go into the medicine cabinet. They get stopped, you know? You know, the, what about the poor kids in China? You never throw anything away? That's what my mother would tell me. Especially your old Vicodin, okay? So none of this stuff gets thrown away. Jimmy comes home and sees his grandma after a hip replacement and says, you know, I'm just going to check the bathroom rug, make sure you don't trip over it, grandma. And he's in there farming around in her medicine cabinet. I mean, and so it used to be 25% of 18 and 25 year olds have abused prescription drugs. And that was in 2008. Now I told you it's gone up to about 25% of 11 to 17 year olds. Direct consumer advertising. The uh, Purdue Pharma budget to uh, market OxyContin was $400 million. Jesus. That was their marketing budget. Okay. Um, baby boomers have doubled the use of illicit drugs. Um, and opiate abuse in that 10 year period rose 400%. Okay. Of the five major painkillers, we're talking about Vicodin, we're talking about Demerol, we're talking about codeine, morphine, dolephine, um, um, uh, Oxycontin down here, Percocet, and uh, uh, the like. You can see that in tons that the, uh, more, uh, the amount is more than doubled. I mean, this stuff is as dangerous as it comes. How we obtain the drugs is very interesting. 56% get them for free from a relative. Okay? Um, uh, I like this, that they buy them from a relative. I have relatives like that. <laughs> so, only 19% from a doctor, so put it in perspective. Okay? But, of course, most of these people, if they weren't getting them online, were getting it. And, and 
you know, there was a time just up until last year when there were more pain clinics in Dade County, Florida than yes. McDonald's. Yes. And non-physicians could own two or three of them. And they get these bum docks in there. And uh, the buses that came out of Kentucky and that whole area were called the OxyContin Express. Okay, Hillbilly Heroin, the OxyContin Express. And what happened is the dealers back up north would give some average Joe who was addicted about five grand in cash. And he would go down and within one afternoon sweep, get all the places, get all the prescriptions, spend the five grand, come back, and split the drugs with the dealer. And um, um, it's because there was no prescription tracking service in Florida until like last year. Now there is, like we have one here. But it was running rampant and literally, literally addicted Appalachia. Yeah. Literally, you used to think it was moonshine. It is not. Those people up there in the hills of Appalachia are doing OxyContin, they're doing Vicodin, they're doing Xanax up the wazoo, they're doing Clonopin, they're doing all those drugs. I don't know what I did. Uh, but let me figure it out. Oh, great. Slow me down when I get forward. source of these drugs. This is CASA's finding. 85% of the sites do not require a prescription. So you ask that question again. Why is this such a problem back there? Well, this is part of the problem. That it's easier to obtain. Several allow for simply fax prescriptions, which of course can be forged. Here's a typical one. No questions ever asked. Uh, popular drugs of the month are Cialis and Valium. Um, we have great teams who uh, make a diagnosis uh, via your testimony, and these are going to be drop shipped to you tomorrow. If you try to trace the source of these, the routing for these drug deliveries are changed in 24 to 48 hours, so you can never catch them. Uh, unintentional drug overdoses that come into the emergency or what we call toxic drug mixtures. We have a new, a new name for this. You know what kills all these people? It's very simple. It's usually a sleep drug like Tamazepam or Restoril along with Valium and Xanax. It's usually Ambien or Lunesta combined with an opiate, usually Oxycontin or Vicodin and alcohol. You're dead. You're dead in the door now. How, do, how does it kill them? Does it shut down the respiratory system? It shuts the respiratory system down. Or it can stop their gag reflux. And if their gag reflex stops and they get sick, then everything bounces off the roof of the mouth and goes down the lungs and they suffocate. Very common. That's how Janice Joplin died in Hendrix Island and Jimmy Morris and that guy. Out well, I can tell you, I can tell you that when they say unintentional, um, I was a uh, family medicine doc in Vermont for about 35 years, and part of that is wearing the hat of the coroner. So I went out on a lot of these calls. You wear all the hats when you're in a country doc, and. Um, the number of people who were loaded at the time of their quote unquote suicide attempt was about 90%. They were drunker than scouts who were loaded on pills. So did they really want to kill themselves? Did they miscalculate? But this is primarily <coughs> potential overdose, a simple miscalculation. Okay? Now remember what happened. I mean, you know, and Elias and I were just talking about this a little while ago. Well, we're getting some people very angry with us south of the border. We took away a lot of business with marijuana, legalizing it up here. We, how they would, what are they going to do? What would you do if you're a business person? You flood the market with the cheapest, most powerful heroin you can possibly find. 
you know, you do heroin on a short run, come in here for detox, get out of here and become what they call opiate naive. In other words, your body doesn't know about heroin and go back and try to do what you did last Tuesday, you're dead on the spot. So much so that we actually had to get to the point where we have first aid for opiate overdoses out there where people carry needles around and they have a family member who relapses to give them some Narcan or just hope. No treatment, it's just, you know, damage control. That's not even harm reduction, it's just like a war avoidance, you know what I mean? Okay. Okay. Um, sales rose tremendously. Oxycontin sales rose six times between 1997. Six times. So that 300 milligrams of painkillers were sold in the 90% of all painkillers in the world are in the United States. 90%. We have a pain epidemic. Yeah, just like we have an attention deficit disorder epidemic. I mean, what kid doesn't have that crap ever done? Adderall is not a safe drug. Ritalin is a very dangerous drug. They are a gateway drug for many of these kids, and they are being given to them by their parents so that they score higher on the SATs. It's, it's OK. Oversight, we have Jayco taking a look at us, the American College of Occupational Medicine stopped recommending these drugs a long time ago. If you've got chronic pain, don't use it. Don't use it for myofascial pain. Please don't give OBH for a small headache. If you get a migraine headache, you need a triptan like Imitrex rather than, you know, Vicodin. They're trying, but barely, barely able to do it. The drugs that are abused, you know most of them. I'm speaking to the choir here, right? Um, opioids, depressants. The sleep anxiety, God forbid, your drug has a little commercial on TV with a butterfly floating in the <laughs> nice restful night's sleep. They are deadly. These disease drugs are deadly. So deadly we've gone back to phenobar to get people to detox because the seizure potential is so gigantic. And the stimulants, which I just talked about for hyper. I had a medical practice for 35 years, and I never, ever gave a single kid, and there were bunches of them that teachers sent in that wanted them treated with these drugs. And I never signed a single prescription except once when I saw it absolutely necessary. It worked like a charm. And there are that subgroup. But if you get diagnosed with this at the age of 22, bullshit. <laughs> OK, that just ain't happening. So it's a scam. And um, all of those kids that had this, I sent them to martial arts. I sent them to martial arts with the parent of the same sex. And they learned to focus. And they learned respect. They learned to cooperate. They learned all of the things that you would hope they got in the classroom. And they, it, they really, really did well. So I still think that that's hopeful for this odd pandemic that we have in this country right now. Out of the opioids, you know most of them. You're all familiar with fentanyl, right? Mm -hmm. The worst of the worst. You don't know that one? Yeah. Uh, Can you share it? Fentanyl is uh, <clears throat> about uh, 100 to 500 times more potent than morphine. It's nice. You need it. When they give you a hip replacement, they saw off your femur and screw in a new replacement and sew you up and kick you out of the hospital and charge you 50 grand, they put you on fentanyl, and you go for that deal. And then they have the yeah, lollipops. Huh? They have the lollipops. They have it in sublingual <laughs> form, and they have it in patch form. Yeah, fentanyl is a very important drug. Uh, you can get fentanyl for a colonoscopy. You don't have a colonoscopy. See? So I'll give you a fentanyl test. You might have had fentanyl and don't even know it. See, if you're getting ready on Sunday night for the colonoscopy and you're drinking all that crap they want you to drink, and the next morning you stand up with your ass sticking out and they get you that funny little down, <laughs> and then some idiot comes up and shows you a tooth that's about two miles long and tells you where it's going to go. <laughs> you know that drill? Okay. And then they give you something in your arm, you go to sleep, the next day you wake up, go back to the doctor and say, can I do another one of those <laughs> They gave you that to them. You understand? That's how strong the drug is. People will actually feign surgeries to get the It's the strongest of the strong. The most addictive of them all. 
except the most addictive of all the opioids, crack cocaine and methamphetamine smoke will probably give it a real one for its money. Okay. I think my battery just ran out. methamphetamine, cocaine, Ritalin, nicotine is a stimulant, ecstasy, you know about all of these. This is the worst drug known to men. If you're in a speed run, it's almost a different disease. You are not going to get better and, and be out of detox for six months to a year, get used to it. But how do you turn the kid around? How do you turn the kid around who's 16, 17 years old and his drug of choice is giving him about a thousand times thank you? more dopamine than the human orgasm. <laughs> I mean, how are you going to turn them around? Thank you very much. Um, other drugs, you're familiar with the Z drugs, ketamine, dissociative drug, PCP, still around. Um, this is an antagonist for benzodiazepines, which can be used to take someone from a benzodiazepine overdose. And strangely enough, is used. GHB, the bodybuilding drug, huge, horrible, bad, 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 dangerous drug. Uh, Methacolone, quaaludes, moment of reverence for the U.S. <laughs> <laughs> Synthetics um, are dangerous and nasty drugs, difficult to test for, very difficult. You're going to use him if you want to test for these drugs. What company is it? Cellbox. You get that? It'd be great. See him. If you have to test for this drug, uh, and that's your drug of choice, especially in young people, you're not going to catch it unless you're doing a special panel. And his company is 86, right? 82 drugs plus plus seven. Call me a liar for <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Bad results. I had no idea what these are. What? I said I had no idea what these are. What these are? Well, all right. You remember uh, when you used to see your dad go into a smoke shop? No, because my dad Okay, your dad didn't smoke. <laughs> You're going to be tough, aren't you? Yeah, yes. Yeah. I took my first drink at 26. Really? Yes. I love that part. I love that. You're a type 2 alcoholic. What does that mean? I'll tell you later. Um, uh, if you're going to find a place to buy cigars, I think they call them tobacconists now. But if you go into a smoke shop, 95% of the smoke shops are just scamming to sell this crap. And these are all the synthetic drugs. They're very, very potent. Uh, one of them is called KTOM. It's a synthetic legal opioid. Um, spice uh, is one of many um, that are uh, synthetic marijuana, uh, bath salts, which will kill you dead, um, much like uh, PCP. Um, special K is ketamine, K2 is another one of the um, teas. They're sold as teas, but they're really smoked as dope. But are you familiar with this one called Smiles? Do you know about Smiles at all? You really want to get scared, and I hope YouTube took this off. But they, had, they only discovered a drug called Smiles when they found about eight kids dead on the streets in Indiana. It was a totally lethal drug that they did. No one knew about how it worked or anything. They just discovered it that way from the toxicology when they were putting them through the uh, you know, forensics. And um, they had a kid on YouTube 
actually taking this and talking it through is high and enticing kids to do it. Anybody see it? Yeah. yeah. And actually talking you through what it was said. Kid was dead by the end of the video. It was like a snuffle. Like a snuffle. One of the worst of the worst. Uh, that's around. And by the way, there's probably a hundred more that will be here next month. Most of them are coming out of China, some coming out of Mexico um, and Eastern Europe. And they change the chemistry by one or two molecules and reintroduce it in no time. And they get, they get huge uh, markets in the, in the rave culture. One of the worst drugs known to man, one that will cause the most heartache, the most difficulty, um, uh, other than nicotine, is dextromethorphan. <coughs> Robitussin DM, over the counter. <coughs> If you get addicted to Robitussin DM, you're in for six months of psychiatric symptoms to a year. It's horrible. Low doses, it stops your cough. Medium doses, it makes you high. And high doses, it is a, a dysphoric drug that causes that kind of dissociative experience. So, um, you know, I've given you a lot of information. The truth of the matter is that um, the worst weapon of mass destruction, the worst drug dealer of all. I agree with the gentleman standing up back there is still the medical profession who has written for a lot of these drugs, but we can't take 200% of the drugs, just about 98, I think. Um, treatment has changed a little bit now. We have interventionists involved for those people who aren't quite ready. We have exquisite medical detoxes with drugs like Suboxone and Naltrexone, Gabapentin for detox anxiety, anti-craving drugs like Campersate vaccines being developed now for cocaine addiction. Uh, we have treatment recommendations that are usually longer. If you want to get well, you're going to stay in treatment longer, stay engaged, that's much better. 12-step um, um, workshops um, and trauma workshops, codependency relapse prevention, extended evaluation programs. If you're not convinced you have the disease, you might as well find out how bad and what the treatment by recommendations. It's not a one size fit all, so we can evaluate people better. Most importantly, based on something called <coughs> Federation of State Physician Health Programs, better outcomes come from monitoring. If you stop treating this disease and you do not monitor it for the next two years, you are destined to have a relapse experience. We advise monitoring for all of our patients. Monitoring means you engage an outside institution that will test your urine uh, randomly, six hours to give a urine for the next two years. There's a contract. That contract says that you go back to treatment or intensify your treatment if you have a slip. It catches the slip early. And it's just like treatment. You get tested in treatment, you stay sober in treatment. You get tested afterwards, you stay sober longer. The reason that's critical is that for the next two years, your brain is healing. For the next three years, your brain is healing. Physicians who monitor and airline pilots who monitor are, uh, have a recovery rate, sobriety rate, recovery rate at uh, five years of 78 to 92 percent. Well, those are the kinds of numbers that we go after for all of our patients. I can't say enough about monitoring. <coughs> um, we have special populations, adolescents, pain patients, psychiatric and behavioral patients, and now special population programs like the professional treatment programs for high achievers, trauma programs, eating gambling, sex addiction, codependency, and so forth. And aftercare also, the interventionists stay with the family, they educate the family, they also get involved in aftercare with plans for discharge to sober living, transitional living, wonderful new programs now like Sober College. I send a lot of patients after treatment now to Northbound, uh, like Netherton's program down in Costa Mesa where kids get into it. They have the Haven program, you can see those kinds of programs where Kids stay sober and engaged. We, we're not gonna we're not gonna win this thing unless we figure out how to make it fun. We gotta make it fun. You know, I had an interesting thing. Though <coughs> many of you are treatment professionals, I think that I had an interesting thing happen to say. I asked all of my professionals, how many of you professionals are afraid that your life is over 
and you're afraid that all the fun's going to stop by being sober. And so a whole bunch of hands went, went up. And I asked, how many of you identified in the previous exercise that you were a workaholic? And they all put their hands up. They seemed to go hand in hand. <clears throat> if, if you're a workaholic and that's your dynamic, you're really afraid to get sober. Because the work served as your gateway to your drinker's life because you're entitled after all that work to have it. That was the game. We thought bullshit. <laughs> we are addicted to our own. Without bullshit, we're all playing the same. Okay? Um, does this work? Sure. Look at the drug courts, the whole program in Hawaii, the 25 4 7 program. These programs have incredible outcomes. Why? You slip once you're in jail. It works. You slip once, you lose your medical license for the docs. You slip once, you lose your FAA license for the pilots. It works. You've got to have consequences. All right? Follow up. We like 12-step abstinence space for everybody, even if they've had some harm reduction or medication-assisted treatment with prolonged buprenorphine treatments. We always have an end date for them to end. I am not a long-term buprenorphine fan. We are about 12 steps abstinence space. Uh, disease maintenance is not an option here. I don't like it. Okay, so my dream, long-term 12-step abstinence-based programs with appropriate medical, medically assisted detoxification um, and short-term medical assistance with abstinence <coughs> as the goal, fortified by a select monitoring program. Uh, monitoring doesn't have to be torture. Some people feel like that. It really is a safety net underneath the tightrope of life, which everybody's <coughs> going to have to walk. What do we expect for the future? I'm just going to go to the last slide and show you. Um, I don't know what to tell you we expect for the future. <laughs> I don't know. Well, let's take a look. It's more globalized. They have modern supply systems. They've been shifted now to tolerate all kinds of behaviors, even promote individual choices. I mean, new tolerance for diversity, tolerance for drug using and behaviors, um, uh, exploiting uh, uh, our youth. Uh, we're in trouble. Greater availability. Hope the roots of administration. No one has to shoot up anymore. The heroin's strong enough to just snort and smoke. Okay? Um, although, if you remember a few years ago, 10, maybe 15, people started getting more tattoos. People started piercing more. So the whole needle taboo kind of died. And it's nothing now to see a little girl of 14 come into us, or 15 come into us. Looks like she's getting ready for her death ball with tracks from here to here or between her toes. But she uses clean needles. Her mom gave it to her. Okay? Um, um, if we widen the behavior thing, we talk about credit cards, and we talk about gambling, we talk about sex, and we have these process addictions in the same head place as the drug and alcohol addictions, we're going to miss the boat a little bit. We have to treat them. They're very important. They can fuel the other one. But the intensity of the brain changes on these something like methamphetamine are just a different ball game, okay? Uh, basically, when you tolerate drug use and when you make drug use cheaper, easier, and safer for the drug user, the drug use usually continues and escalates. Duh. I mean, duh. <laughs> And that's what's happening. So I don't mean to leave this on a pessimistic note. Um, sobriety is sobriety. Recovery is recovery. There's lots of good reasons for it. I have mine. You have yours. Um, um, but the main thing is that we, we just can't stop this one day at a time. Perseverance. Don't ever quit. Okay? Thank you very much. Very excellent. Um, hang around, he has books, and then there is a tour if you want to see uh, the treatment center as well. Thank you.